You all know that I was a Southern Baptist pastor for 45 years of my life. And in the 1970s, my denomination, which had been uh, extremely blessed by God, had leadership that was drifting to the left, drifting away from the truth. And the convention found itself embroiled in a great con controversy over God's word. Is the Bible the inerrant word of God or isn't it? Is the word of God, is the Bible the word of God without any mixture of error? Or in other words, is it true and does the truth of Scripture really matter? Now, during that same time, many mainstream denominations were making that drift toward the left also. And the outcomes were, were horrible for them. They went down that road that the Bible only contains truth. And since it only contains truth and it isn't the truth, then the interpretation of the Word of God is open for debate. And I want you to notice what that led to. Many denominations now have wrong views about sexuality because, after all, the Scripture is open for debate, and so I can look at what God says about human sexuality through my own prism, and I can come up with answers that seem good to me that I like. Wrong views about marriage. And what marriage really is, the sanctity of a husband and wife living together. Wrong views, really not wrong views, but out and out heresies. And I use that H word on purpose here, like denying the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Denying the deity of Christ. And probably the worst doctrinal era, the worst biblical era that Satan has ever given to the church is a doctrine called universalism. And universalism states that since God is a God of love, and since he wants to bless all men, that every person is going to end up in heaven, no matter what they do on the earth, no matter what they do with Jesus Christ, after all, since we can interpret Scripture the way we want, we can see a loving God who would never condemn a person to hell. In 1979, a group of Southern Baptist pastors that included Adrian Rogers, Charles Stanley, a great man of God by the name of Paige Patterson, and a handful of other people began what was called the conservative resurgence. And it took 12 very hard years. But these men led the Southern Baptist Convention back to the truth that the Bible is the inerrant word of God without any mixture of error. And guys, I, I base my entire ministry, in fact, I base my life on the truth of Scripture. So I want to ask the question, does the truth of Scripture really matter. And I suspect that almost everyone in here, I'd like to say everyone, but I'm going to say almost everyone, I, I suspect that all of us are going to affirm that statement. The truth of Scripture really matters. But then again, does it really matter? Hear that blessed rain? You know what that's doing right now, don't you? It's washing away the snow. Amen, I agree. Does truth really matter? Here's statements that I hear very often when Scripture is plainly presented. Well, pastor, that's just not the way I see it. Or I hear, you know... That's just not what I have experienced in my life. Well, you know, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. 
Let me give you some clarifying questions here. The, the, the overarching question is, does the truth of Scripture really matter? But here's some questions that clarify that. Are we free to interpret the Word of God any way we like? Can, can I take God's Word and, and, and am I free to mold the Word of God into what I want it to say? Are we free to interpret God's Word in the light of experiences we've had rather than interpreting our experiences in the light of the Word of God? Are we free to disagree, free to agree to disagree on matters that are plainly taught in the Word of God? Now, guys, I've told you who I am. And I'm just a hillbilly preacher from the Ozark Mountains. But there are four things that I do when I open the Word of God. Whether it's devotional time or whether I'm studying for a, a teaching or for a preaching session. One thing I do is to forget traditions. Scripture, listen to me. Scripture always trumps tradition. My tradition does not matter. I try to shed myself of denominational stances. What a denomination says does not matter. It is what the Word of God says. I put aside my personal preferences, and we all have them. Every one of us, if we're honest, will look at the Word of God, and at times we will say, I would really like it to say this. And then four, I try to keep in mind that the experiences that I've had in my journey as a child of God must always align with God's Word. And if I have experiences that are not taught in the Word of God, I remember what the old timers used to say, that if it's not in the Word of God, it cannot be the will of God. I've been blessed the last 35 years to be able to spend four or five hours a day, four or five days a week studying the Word of God. That's above my devotional time. And I've been blessed by the Word of God. It speaks into my heart, changes my life, it changes my direction. I've grown through it. I've become not only a better Christian, but I've become a better man because of the Word of God. I've been a better father, a, a better husband, a better grandfather, a better pastor, all because of the Word of God. I've taught it. I've preached it. I've contended for the truth of it. I've taken on organizations, and I've taken on politicians all for the Word of God. I take God's Word very seriously. And I take the truth of Scripture very, very seriously. So I ask the question again, does the truth of Scripture really matter? So stand with me and let's read this text and let's talk about the truth of Scripture. Galatians chapter 1 beginning in verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Now, the Greek word there is anathema, and I'll tell you in a little bit what anathema literally means. Now, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to pe please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Father, as we walk through this text, would you allow me 
the grace to rightly divide your word and to present it clearly and effectively. And Father, would you be pleased to let it change lives this morning? I pray and ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So we ask this question, does the truth of Scripture really matter? There are three items that I want you to see this morning. And the first is this. I want you to see that there was a crisis of truth. Now, right out of the box, when you read this text, you understand that the Galatians had been deeply confused. Uh, Paul said in verse 7, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion. Now, who were these people? A and what was the confusion that they were calling? Well, guys, there was a group of people from Jerusalem, a, a group of people who had been saved, out of Judaism, they knew Jesus Christ, but they wanted to exercise their Christ life through Judaism. And there was a real reason why they wanted to do that. You see, when a Jew came to know Jesus Christ, the moment that he made that public pronouncement of his faith in Jesus Christ, he was an outcast from Judaism. He was an outcast from the community. Many families in Jesus' day literally had funeral services for a Jew who came to know Christ. And that term that we hear thrown around today, that person is dead to me, that's where that came from. When a Jew came to know Jesus Christ to the rest of his family, he was dead to them. Now, what they were doing is they were mixing Christianity with Judaism and they were coming up with a mixture that was neither but it was keeping them from persecution and these guys dogged Paul everywhere he went as Paul preached they would they would come in behind him and they would begin to spread this false doctrine now, now the word confused was a very interesting word a and the word means to harass. It, it means to bring pressure on somebody. One translator, uh, A.T. Robertson says, this is so far as to say that this word means to disturb someone mentally. And here was the M.O. of these Judaizers as they came in behind Paul and began to preach their false doctrine. They would come in and they would say, yes, it is true that you're saved by Jesus Christ. You put your faith in him and you're saved. But after that, you are free to interpret this the way you want. You are free to exercise all the rituals, all the laws, all of the traditions that the Pharisees had, and you can be both a Christian and a Jew. Now, my suspicion is, along with that teaching, and I can't be dogmatic about this, but, but my suspicion is that while they were doing that, they were also allowing them to know that, you know, as we practice our brand of Christianity, we're not suffering any kind of persecution for that. So what they were doing was sowing confusion among a group of very new converts. And God, Paul's contempt for these people is evident in the original language. The words he chooses, the tenses in which he places these words, let you know that, that Paul was contemptuous of these people. No doubt they were slick in their message. No doubt they appealed to the intellect of these people. No doubt they appealed to that side that said, you can have Christ and still not suffer persecution. Now, guys, what they were doing, they were coming in, and whenever they got a new convert to listen, they wouldn't let go of them until they beat them down and caused them to believe the way they wanted them to believe. Isn't that a horrible thing? Guys, these folks weren't only confused. The Bible says that they were deserting the truth. Now, the churches of Galatia, uh, 
that, that little region. And Paul founded these churches on his first missionary journey. And you remember after each of his three missionary journeys, he went back either to Antioch or to Jerusalem to tell the elders of the church what had gone on and what he was seeing and witnessing from the Word of God and how people were being saved by the gospel of Christ. And before he even got back to Antioch, these Judaizers had come in and they were teaching this hellacious doctrine. Now, Paul has some interesting choices of words here in this text. In the original language, Paul wanted to present this in a way that they could not misunderstand the intensity of what he was teaching these people. The word to depart, literally, we would, we would translate that to apostatize, to fall away from, or to move away from, to transfer allegiance. Uh, <laughs> Mount says in his commentary, that word was used of someone who had become a turncoat. So Paul was saying, I, I, am, I am astounded that you have so quickly become a turncoat of Christ and of the gospel he preaches. Now, he did put that word in the present tense, which means that it was in the process of happening. This was not yet a done deal. They were in the process of apostatizing. They were in the process of moving away from the gospel of Christ and moving away from Christ. Now, watch this. Paul uses words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that makes it very clear that when you depart from the Word of God, you are also departing from Christ. Listen, listen very carefully here. When we trade the truth of God for a lie, we are deserting Christ. This is no light matter. This is not something for us to scoff at. The truth of God is serious business. Romans 3, 4, Paul said, Let God be true and every man a liar. John 17, 7, Jesus' own words in that high priestly prayer where he prayed not only for the disciples but prayed for all of us also. He said to the Father, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Or again, Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, the last part of this crisis. The last part of the crisis of truth is the perversion of the gospel. Paul said, and you are turning to a different gospel. He also said, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what exactly was the perversion? It was adding to the Scripture. It was adding to the word that God gave through the, the apostles and through the prophets. And the addition of that was putting Judaism into Christianity. Now, Paul teaches teaches very plainly in the book of Galatians that Christ was about building the church and taking the old and the new and merging them together into one new body called the church. Not the Jewish church, not the Christian church, but one body in Christ. And they were adding Judaism. They were adding ceremonies. They were adding their holy days. They were adding their feasts and saying, yes, you are saved by Christ, but you're kept saved by doing all of these things. And Paul called it perversion. How did they get to this? How did they get to the point where they were willing to pervert the gospel of Christ? They got there by a by interpreting the gospel of Christ in the light of their own experience. They based their teaching and experience on 
No persecution if you stay in Judaism. No dead to your family. No being cast out of the synagogue, which was the centerpiece of life. Folks, may I ask you a question? Do you believe that there is a crisis of truth in the modern church? Over half of American Christians, now this is surveys done by the Barna Group, over half of American Christians do not believe Satan is real or that the Holy Spirit even exists. But Satan is a symbol for evil and the Holy Spirit is a symbol for good. 39% of American Christians believe that Jesus sinned while he was on the earth. And since he sinned while he was on the earth, he must also have had to be saved. Heresy. 55% of Americans are, are Christians only 55% of Christians in America agree that the Bible is accurate in all the principles that it teaches. 45% of modern Christians do not believe that the Bible is the inerrant, immutable word of the Heavenly Father. Guys, Barna goes on and on and on and on and on what American Christians don't believe. But isn't it true that we live in a day and age where there is a crisis of truth in the churches around us? May it never be said of Cornerstone Church that there is a crisis of truth. And I will vow to you, to the best of my ability, and being led by the Holy Spirit of God, that there will be no crisis of truth as long as I occupy this pulpit. I will preach the truth in love. Now, I want you to see the second item in this text. And that second item is a definitive answer. Now, verse 8 and 9 both say this. I'm just going to read verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Now, for emphasis, Paul, Paul repeats the same verse again almost exactly. Now, the NIV that I read from, and I think is a fairly accurate translation, the NIV tones down Paul's message quite a bit. And, they, and they, the, the, the translators of the NIV say, let him be or let them be under God's curse. The Greek word there is anathema. And... And it literally means consigned to damnation. Paul is saying, when somebody perverts the truth of, of Scripture, let them be consigned to damnation. Do you think Paul took the gospel seriously? Do you think he took the truth of the Word of God in a way that he wouldn't pervert it, nor would he stand for anybody else to pervert the Word of truth? Why such a harsh statement? Why have I been willing to stand against organizations that wanted to pervert the truth? To stand up in political meetings and, and share the truth of the Word of God when they were getting ready to make decisions that I knew would kill our community. They were allowed to go because they were so abhorrent in the sight of God. The reason for that is because Scripture does matter. Watch this. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth one confesses unto righteousness, and with the heart confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 17, listen to this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There is a lost world out there 
There are multitudes of people, many whom we know and love, who do not yet know Jesus Christ and His saving grace, and that salvation is based entirely on the truth of the Word of God. If the Bible is not true, we have no assurance that we're going to heaven when we die. If the Bible is not true, we have no assurance that when we walk through dark times that the Spirit of the living God is going to walk with us. If the Word of God is not true, guys, what we're doing here in this church is an asinine exercise. The Word of God is true. It is an errant without any mixture of error, and the truth of Scripture really does matter. And there's a lost world that's depending on good churches like Cornerstone to stand for the truth and preach the message in purity and simplicity and for the, the, the folks that congregate here to take that message out to a lost and dying world with full confidence that when somebody asks Jesus to save them, that he comes into their life and gives them new life, new hope, new purpose. And that is all based on the truth of the inerrant, infallible world Word of God. One final item. That is a modern dilemma. Let's bring this up to the 21st century. You remember the last message that I preached on the Holy Spirit, and I talked about not gifts of the Spirit, but gifts to the churches. In Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry that we no longer, listen to this, verse 14, Ephesians 4, that we no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and carried around by every wind of teaching and by the clever cunning of men in their deceitful scheming. Does that happen today? Let me list some things that are being taught on blogs and radios and, and, and YouTube. That Jesus Christ is not really the Son of God. That there are many ways to get to heaven. That Jesus was only one of God's Son that God sent to save the world. That Jesus was a sinner who had to be saved. That if you truly have faith in God, you'll be wealthy and never, ever be sick. Are you listening, church? That if you go to the right conference at the right church, you can give prophetic messages to people on demand. That Jesus, Mary Magdalene, were married and had a love child that you can go to a great Christian's grave, lay down on that grave, and you can soak up that person's spirit and have part of their spirit in you. That Jesus didn't really die on the cross. That Jesus wasn't really raised from the dead. Are you listening, church? That only 144,000 people are really ever going to be saved and go to heaven. That you can be baptized for the dead and somehow impact their eternity. That the world is getting better and better and we're on the verge of ushering in God's kingdom. Don't tell that to the FBI. That I can touch your forehead and somehow slay you in the spirit and knock you to the ground. That speaking in tongues is evidence of being filled with the Spirit of God. Church, are you listening to me? That a Christian is never judged for their sins after salvation and there is never any punishment. When Paul directly says, we shall all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That the Bible has errors in it. That God gives extra messages to some people today that are as valid as Scripture. That Jesus stopped being God while he was on the earth. And every person somehow is going to end up in heaven. Church, are you listening? Damnable doctrine. Now here's the modern dilemma for the church as, as it relates to the truth of Scripture. One is technology. 
And I have a love-hate relationship with technology. I uh, have a site where I can pull up every sermon that W.A. Criswell ever preached. W.A. Criswell is one of my heroes in the faith. A Bible expositor who, who just brought the word to life. And I can go, sometimes I read them, sometimes I can even get an old ratty video of him preaching. I can Google one word and I can find every scripture reference with that word in it. It used to take me hours to run all that stuff down. But here's my hate relationship with it. Through technology... You can listen to a million different preachers preaching a million different things and they do exactly what Paul's talking about. Their cunning and their craftiness, they appeal to the intellect, they make their doctrine sound so good and it is damning people to a devil's hell. Now that's not everybody on the internet but it's many. And if you're not saturated by the Word of God, you'll fall victim to it. I heard Chuck Swindoll say at a, at a Promise Keepers meeting in Dallas a number of years ago. My son was 10 or 11, so it's been, gracious, 25 years. This has stuck with me. Swindoll said, every Christian man in America needs to be so saturated with the Word of God that the very blood that courses through his veins is bibbling blood. And I don't know if that's even a word, but the principle is to get it in and to get it in. And when you get it inside of you, Many, many people in the average evangelical church needs to spend more time studying doctrine, studying the truth before they ever study podcasts or books. My second love-hate relationship is with the term evangelical. I, I love it because it gives the idea that an evangelical church is inclusive that anyone can come, and that truly is true. But my hate relationship with it is the term evangelical church cannot be rightly defined. What does an evangelical church really believe? Some will believe the truth of Scripture just exactly as it is written. Some evangelical churches go so far as to pervert the very gospel of Jesus Christ. A third, this is just a hate relationship, I guess. The modern church is not doing very well at discipling its converts. And I can make that more personal. From my personal observation here, Cornerstone has not done a great job in discipling new members and new converts. You okay? Just say it. We're taught, in fact, we just went over this in the core values class. Reach, teach, send, and repeat. We reach people. And Cornerstone has a marvelous history of winning people to Christ. A great heritage as an evangelistic church. But how deep does the discipleship go? Now, I want to briefly give you a couple of takeaways this morning. And I think these are extremely important. If you are not saturated in New Testament doctrine, it's very possible that you're subjecting yourself to teachers who are teaching error. If you do not know the truth, it's impossible to recognize the errors. And so when someone begins to preach or teach 
and, and they sound good, and they use selected scriptures as proof text, and they appeal to the intellect, and they appeal to the emotion. If you're not locked in on the truth of the Word of God, it's very easy to fall victim to their error. My old pappy had a saying, just you guys have heard this. You swallowed that, son, hook, line, and sinker. Now, number two, Christ has called us to a higher calling. 2 Timothy 2.15, and I'm quoting this out of the King James Bible because it is the very best translation of this. Study to show, show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, who is rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen to me. There is no excuse for not knowing the truth of God's Word. As a child of God, if you don't care enough to dig out the truth of Scripture, you don't love God enough, guys. Now, I know that you're not free to give the time that God has blessed me with as a full-time pastor. But you have time. And if you love the Word of God, you will saturate yourself with the Word of God. The, quote, evangelical church has led a myth that if you give God 10 to 15 minutes a day, you're doing a great job with your devotional life. Number three, most important thing I can tell you today, the lost world must have the gospel of truth presented clearly, purely, simply, and it has to be the very truth of the gospel. You can hear a pin drop in here right now. I'm sorry. Guys, I love you. The first time that Janice and I uh, walked in here, the first day that I preached in here, uh, before we were ever candidates to come and be the interim pastor, I fell in love with you. Not this building, although it's marvelous, but I fell in love with you. The church. And I cannot say that I love you if I don't preach the truth to you. And guys, here's my fear. Here is my fear. That some, if not many, are swallowing error rather than digesting it, understanding it, and turning away from it. Now, I've mentioned the truth of the gospel a number of times. Here is what the pure gospel of Jesus Christ is. That there is a sin problem that man has. Every one of us is a sinner by nature, birthed into a fallen race, and we're sinners by choice, every one of us. I don't need to define sin to an adult audience. You know what sin is. Now, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me paint you this picture. There is a loving God who created mankind for intimate fellowship with himself to know us, to walk through life with us, to guide us, to lead us. But that holy God cannot fellowship with sin. He can't walk with us while we are still sinners and our sin hasn't been dealt with. And There was this chasm that's created between God and man because of the 
sinful choice of mankind. And when God said the time is just right, he sent forth his son to be born of a woman so, and born under the law so that he might redeem those under the law. He came and lived life as a man just as we do but without any sin. And then he went to a cruel cross. And on that cruel cross, he gave his life, shed his blood, gave his body to deal with that sin debt. Now, any man, woman, boy, or girl who is willing to turn from their sin, turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God says, I will give you the gift of eternal life. And there's some here today that you have never taken that offer from God to come and be part of his family and have the assurance of eternal life. Bow your heads with me, would you please? Every head bowed and every eye closed. And guys, I would never embarrass a soul. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand, uh, do anything that would call attention to people around you. But here's what I want you to do. If you're thinking right now, you know, I never really have accepted that gift of salvation, but I know I need to. If that's on your heart and you would like me to pray for you, would you just lift your head up and make eye contact with me? Just look up here until I see you. Look right up here, okay? Okay? Look right up here. Okay? Okay? All right? Uh, any one of you who would be willing to just come and say, Jesus, save me. I'll help you right down here at the front. But I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, there are a number of people who by their indication say, I know I need to be saved and I need Pastor Terry to pray for me. Right now, Father, would you give them courage, courage to step out of their seat and come down here and, and just say, Pastor Help me come to know Jesus. Give them that strength. Convict them in a way that they can't get away from that. And Father, we'll give you glory. We'll give you praise. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.